Okay, so we are going to House File 2008 from Representative Klaus Kozlowski. Since Representative Kozlowski is not a member of this committee, I will move to refer House File 2008 to the Children's and Family Finance and Policy Committee. Uh, Representative Kozlowski, welcome to the uh, committee. I understand you have an A1 Authors Amendment. Could you please move the, uh, uh, I will move the Authors A1 Amendment. Uh, could you please explain it to us, please? Yes, thank you, Chair and members of the committee. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be here for House File 2008. And yes, this uh, is a technical amendment. We would just like it to be considered in order to better clarify eligibility and the types of services that will be offered. Okay, members, any questions on the A1 Authors Amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor of adopting the A1 Authors Amendment signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Motion prevails and the amendment, the amendment is adopted. We'll go back to the bill. Uh, Representative Kozlowski, please explain your bill as amended. Excellent. Well, uh, again, thank you for the opportunity for um, hearing this bill today. I'm proud to be here with a number of folks from my district, from uh, a number of folks who have been working in collaboration on this homeless youth direct cash transfer pilot bill. Um, this is brought forth in partnership with the Opportunity Youth Network and many others and has been a proposal in partnership between St. Louis County, Hennepin County, homeless youth service providers, community-based organizations, research institution, um, but most importantly, our youth have been driving and will be um, in the driver's seat as uh, this is implemented. With evidence-based practices in mind, House File 2008 is really an effort to intentionally focus on specific homeless youth, um, and also give them the hand up needed to create stable, successful lives. I also want to just call attention that there's a handout which has been provided with much more detail about the needs and the mechanics of our proposal. But basically, this bill um, is to create a four-year pilot in which this coalition works with an intermediary organization to allocate a monthly stipend to eligible homeless youth ages 18 to 24. And in order for this pilot program to be most effective, um, House File 2008 waives the stipend from counting as an income. Um, this really enables inv individuals to maintain their eligibility and to receive other services that are necessary, as we know, to stabilize um, and secure their lives. Uh, so, Chair, I would ask to give you a face and a voice to the challenges that many of our homeless youth um, experience and how this pilot can address the situation. I have a handful of testifiers here to offer some brief remarks, and I will turn it now over to my first testifier. Very good. Uh, thank you for the presentation. If you'd like to go ahead, introduce yourself, who you're with, and begin your testimony. Great. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Dr. Jordan Unison Chisty. I'm the executive director of LifeHouse, which is located in Duluth. Um, we serve homeless and streetwise young people ages 14 to 24 throughout the Northeast region and beyond. LifeHouse serves about 900 young people on an annual basis, with 60% of them being indigenous, black, or youth of color. 42% are young parents. LifeHouse provides vital wraparound supportive services for our youth and young families. We have a drop-in center to access basic needs. We are the access point for young people who needing assistance with housing. We have two residential sites which are licensed. We have a mental health and wellness team for no cost and no insurance. And that ranges from licensed clinical social workers to peer recovery specialists. And we also support youth with their education with a licensed teacher and employment opportunities. My staff of over 40 people know how to handle and navigate youth walking through our doors given their crisis and traumatic situations. We receive funding from the Pathways Home Act to support these vital life-saving services. Um, and this bill, this particular bill, is an opportunity to stabilize and bolster our support for our, our underserved young community members. Who are our future leaders? Imagine having the opportunity to be part of changing history for generations to come. Imagine if you were 19, unstably housed and struggling to survive. If you had cash for housing needs, along with all our wraparound supportive services mentioned above at no cost, to feel fully supported in your life. 
This bill provides us a way to see what impact we can make in our young people's lives and who will feel tr we will trust them and fully support them in their process. This bill allows us to deepen our work beyond crisis intervention. It allows us to engage youth in an opportunity to make a difference for their children and generations to come. So please support House File 2008 and invest in our future generations. And I thank you for your time and commitment in supporting our young people in our communities. Thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, next I have would be uh, Janae Peterson. Hi, right, welcome to the committee. Thank you for being here. Please introduce yourself and start your testimony. Thank you, Chair. And I am not Janae, I am Laura Birnbaum, but Janae will follow oh, okay. shortly. All right. um, so thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Laura Birnbaum and I work for St. Louis County Public Health and Human Services. I supervise our housing and homelessness programs team. I am excited, hopeful, and grateful to be here today to express my support for House File 2008 and encourage yours. Uh, we know that young adults ages 18 to 24 are overrepresented when it comes to facing homelessness. This is not only true in metro areas, but also in greater Minnesota rural communities, like those found in St. Louis County. At the end of last week, 173 people ages 18 to 24 were unhoused in St. Louis County. This includes 136 single people, of which nine are pregnant, and 37 families. The number of young people in our coordinated entry system is not decreasing, despite active efforts to expand permanent supportive housing and related programming. In St. Louis County, we see young people leaving unsafe situations, doing their best, and due to not feeling safe in traditional shelter spaces, will often stay with friends, couch hop, or find shelter in places not meant for human habitation. We also see young people return to homelessness due to financial struggles that are no fault of their own. Young people are connected to benefits that provide a basic level of support, such as food support or SNAP, um, health insurance like MA. Um, however, this doesn't get anywhere near the need for young people to access housing. Herein lies the gap that direct cash transfers could empower young adults to address. Young people need more tools where they can have ownership, more choices, and flexibility to be able to utilize creativity in determining their own housing solutions where they can move out of crisis and surviving into thriving, creating the opportunity to break cycles of homelessness and poverty. And we would be able to learn from this work to replicate what works across the state due to the critical research component with Chapin Hall, which you'll hear more about in a little bit. Innovative programming that is responsive to young people's voices and experiences is the solution. They are the experts. Please support House File 2008. This is an amazing opportunity for you and for Minnesota to lead and champion in ending youth homelessness. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for being here at the committee today. Okay, next, would Janae Peterson be the next person then, or? Nope. One moment. Uh, let's go to Sarah uh, Berger-Gonzalez. Um, good afternoon, Chairman Fisher and members of the committee. My name is Sarah Berger Gonzalez, and I'm a senior policy analyst at Chapin Hall at the University of Chicago, uh, an independent nonprofit research and policy center. Chapin Hall's mission is to improve outcomes and well being for individuals, families, and communities that experience adversity. We collaborate with public agencies, practitioners, community, and fellow knowledge developers to produce rigorous research, build effective services and systems, and accelerate the use in evidence and practice. I have been working in the field of economic supports for well over 15 years, and I am currently part of a team of experts working nationally to reduce the prevalence of youth homelessness with it, along with its human costs. Since 2019, collaborative teams have been working to develop, implement, and study the effectiveness of direct cash transfers with youth-driven supportive services as an intervention to address youth homelessness, bolster racial equity, and enable young people to get on paths to thriving. Here in Minnesota, with initial funding from philanthropy, we have been working with young adults with lived expertise, the provider community, local evaluators, and local government, and implementation partners to adapt the cash transfer model for St. Louis and Hennepin counties. The bill before the committee would make Minnesota the first to take a statewide approach in developing evidence and infrastructure for a scalable policy solution to Minnesota's youth homelessness crisis. 
I would like to convey three main points concerning the current state of knowledge on supports for young people experiencing homelessness and housing instability. First, current housing solutions for youth and young adults fall short of impact at the population level. Direct cash transfers with supportive services offer a promising solution to addressing youth homelessness in Minnesota. A recent analysis of homelessness systems data across 10 diverse communities found that only one third of young adults who enter local homelessness systems obtain entry to permanent housing programs, and that those who get housed wait on average four to five months. Nationally, vouchers are extremely hard to find among young adult headed households with less than 3% receiving a voucher. When young people manage to secure housing vouchers, they face insurmountable challenges to deploying them. Other housing programs available to young people are primarily crisis driven and reactive and there is little evidence that existing program models help young people achieve and sustain safe and stable housing. During the pandemic, direct cash transfers likely prevented homelessness among millions of American households. We trusted families to deploy funds as they saw fit to positive ends. We can do the same with young people. There's a large international evidence base supporting direct cash transfers as a prompt, safe, and effective way to support individuals experiencing adversity. Direct cash transfers with youth-driven support services, what we call a cash plus model, are a promising solution. HF 2008 presents an important opportunity to direct benefits to young people, potentially yielding public cost savings relative to status quo intervention models, expanding promise among young people at a critical time in development, and increasing the likelihood that they will pursue education and occupy their optimal place in the workforce. Second, we need a greater understanding of young people's pathways through homelessness if we wish to inform sustainable systems level change. Research paints a picture of the risks of homelessness among young people. Although we tend to see homelessness as an individual problem, risk for homelessness is highly unequal among young people, with higher prevalence among American Indian and Alaska Native, black, multiracial, Hispanic youth, and young adults. Young people identifying as LGBTQI face an increased risk for homelessness, and the intersection of different marginalized identities compounds these inequities. Pregnant and parenting young adults and those who have been involved in public systems like child welfare and juvenile justice also have an increased risk. Even as we have learned much about the drivers of youth homelessness, we lack effective strategies to prevent it, minimize its duration and impact, and avoid reoccurrence. This has enormous human and financial costs. Much of this has to do with the absence of longitudinal data in Minnesota on young people's outcomes and pathways, especially after exiting shelters and other homelessness programs. To this end, this bill will enable critical evidence building. With the right resources, we will learn together whether, how cash, whether and how cash and services improve young people's housing situations, enable them to pursue education and vocation and more. <clears throat> the pilot project here in Minnesota will place Minnesota among a small number of innovators. New York City, San Francisco, California, about a half dozen other jurisdictions are playing cash plus models just like this one. The Chapin Hall team has created a uniform evaluation strategy across sites, enabling us to pool data and understand the differential effects of the program. Minnesota can lead, contribute to, and benefit from this. Finally, an effective Cash Plus program will anticipate, identify, and manage barriers to success so that recipients of cash transfers do not experience this benefit at the expense of other supports, what we commonly know as the benefits cliff. This last November, Chapin Hall published a policy toolkit designed and informed by young people with lived expertise to provide timely analysis and recommendations with respect to designing and implementing DCT programs in ways that minimize risks and maximize benefits. If public assistance benefits or other public resources are withheld or reduced for young people who are participate in the Cash Plus intervention, the effective value of, of the payments will be diminished, possibly producing new adversities and inequalities. As such, the current provisions of HF 2008 are quite germane to the success of this program and would enable young adults experiencing homelessness to participate in the pilot without threatening public benefits such as health care, food assistance, and temporary assistance. In closing, passing this legislation places Minnesota among innovators and sets precedent for other states to follow suit, laying the foundation for testing and scaling youth co-design interventions to address homelessness. I wish to express my gratitude on behalf of my colleagues, including Minnesotans with lived expertise. I would be pleased to, an honor to make myself available to the committee um, as consideration for HF 2008 um, moves forward. Thank you so much for your time. You're welcome, and thank you for your testimony. Uh, next, uh, Quincy Powell.
Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and begin your testimony. Hello, my name is Christy Snyder. I'm clearly not Quincy. He got stuck at the airport. Um, so I'm gonna read his testimony. Um, my name is Quincy Poe and I'm the Opportunity Youth Network co-lead at Youth Prize. Opportunity youth are young people who experience homelessness, have been in the foster care system, young parents and or youth who are disconnected from educational resources and employment. Youth Prize has been stewarding this work using our connections with young adults and adult partners throughout the state to forward the best policy solutions. Throughout every aspect of doing this work, it has been in partnership with young people that we serve. We conducted adaptation workshops with over 100 young people with lived experience in Hennepin County to learn from them, to understand what they would have wanted to move from surviving to thriving. These would have included housing navigation, mental and chemical health resources, independent living skills, mentorship, financial coaching. As we, as we, as the capacity support at Youth Prize, will do the same adaptation workshops and learn from young people in all parts of St. Louis County to design the same sorts of supportive services that young people may need there. We know that while young people have many things that are similar, the challenges of place can make things radically different. Young people are ready to make big moves for themselves and the community they, the community. They just need the right supports to get there. As a former young person who has navigated homelessness in the Twin Cities myself, the impact of what direct cash transfers could have done for me would have been a game changer. Like many of the young people who have partnered with us in this work and focus groups that we have held, when I was homeless and young adult, I often ran into different barriers when trying to get help. Barriers that would have me to choose between the help I could get, which would ultimately keep me sustained in my struggle. We have the opportunity to work with young adults in a way where we can be transformative and move the needle forward. An opportunity to say that in Minnesota, we work to look at all of the options on the table that propel the young adults in our communities towards where they can thrive. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. You so Next, I have Miriam St. Clair. Can we Oh yeah, <laughs> Janae's here. Uh, let's take Janae, please. Hi, good afternoon. Welcome to the committee. Thanks for taking the time to be here. If you'd like to please introduce yourself and then begin your testimony. Um, hello, I'm Janae Peterson. I work for the Hennepin uh, County Youth Advisory Board. Uh, I'm very nervous, so. That's okay. D just take a deep breath. Uh, sorry. Um, homeless individuals die at a rate three times higher than that of Minnesota's general population. That statistic increases when those who are homeless are under the age of 24. Children at any age can face homelessness. Homelessness and poverty does not discriminate. It does not see a child and think, let me have mercy. I was adopted at four from Haiti and I was left to the system at 11. Uh, I was homeless for the first time at age 16. From there, multiple organizations helped me gain stability. From programs that helped me balance school and work and others that provided <laughs> financial stability and practical living skills. Many young adults have faced homeless lists, like I have. Uh, many did not have the resources I did and died as a result. A program like the direct uh, trash, <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Oh, a program, okay. just, you're doing fine. A program like the direct cash transfer can help add a stable foundation for our community's young adults. So we don't have to pick whether to continue education or starve. So we don't have to worry that we may freeze in a Minnesota winter. The foundation that temporary financial security can provide benefits all. That young adults could be the, ne uh, the next neurosurgeon, the next engineer, or the next great author. We are more than what we can see. We are more than what we know. Only the future holds the answers uh, for the questions asked today. Let statistics talk, let the results move you. It does not hurt to try, but if we do not try at all, we lose irreplaceable lives and potential. Thank you for listening to what the Hennepin Youth uh, Advisory Report has to say today. All right, thank you so much. Thank you for taking the time to be here and thank you for your testimony. You did a nice job. Miriam? Okay, is there? Miriam St. Clair? Come on down.
Thank you for being here today. If you'd like to introduce yourself and then you can begin your testimony, please. Absolutely. My name is Miriam and uh, I'm sorry I'm out of breath because I couldn't find parking. I just arrived. Oh, take your time. Take a deep breath. Thank you so much. This is very important for me and I hope it's not too much. I hope you do listen to me because I'm an immigrant and I wondered if I should be here today. But it has been my belief that our country is a home for all those who yearn for freedom. And so I will share with you a brief tale of hope and struggle for the American dream and to support my wish to see the direct cash payment program enacted in our communities. The present system of benefits indicates that the government knows my problems, my choices, and my needs better than I do. Here is the reason why this is wrong, ineffective, and in need of immediate action. I applied for asylum when I was 19 years old. Disowned by my family, my country, hunted by nightmares and trauma, I found myself homeless, alone, and yet I was happy and proud that I could lean on the entity I dreamt of as a five-year-old child in Africa, a country where girls become rock stars, and a government that invests in free folks, ready to seek their potential. For four years, I have been the recipient of GRH and cash benefits. That means a roof on top of my head and an average of $100 per month, only in the form of grocery cards. I am a survivor. I needed to go to college. I needed job trainings, a cup of coffee to share with a friend, a car to lessen the harm on my physical disabilities during winter, gas, and maybe a suit and some makeup so I can keep pretending that I'm worth something. I worked to earn $40,000 scholarship, and yet I was held back by something called the Ally HTC student rule. I live in youth government housing. So here I went fighting poverty, disability, and a federal law with a $100 Target gift card. I almost sold my kidney, but I instead decided to prove to you that I can make good choices under the most devastating circumstances. It took me a year. I worked, I begged, I climbed hierarchies with grievances and appeals so I could stay housed and use my scholarship. But three weeks before my first semester, I ended in the hospital receiving shock therapy. I was so exhausted and depressed that I simply couldn't move a muscle. Thanks to COVID stimulus checks, I was able to buy a car. I went to school and found a way to stay in housing. Every day I maintained a 4.0, and every day I had to fight the instant gratification offered by crime, drugs, prostitution, and suicide. Most of my young neighbors were not as resilient, and they are also recipients of GRH, BHA, and cash benefits. They also have access to the on-site social workers, who I'm, who I, whom I believe are here to help us make good decisions. What decisions are there to make with a grocery gift card? Today, I want you to know that I held my end when it comes to the promise of the American dream. Two months ago, I was the first resident to earn a bachelor's in international relations at a facility which your counties and your taxes are funding. I would like to humbly declare that I'm not special. Many young Americans who lived at this facility could have done the same. They simply didn't have the capacity to endure as much pain and systemic incompetence as I did. The cost of navigating the current welfare system is too high to the extent where I promise you, I can't provide the same amount of resilience and sanity anymore. Thank you so much. Thank you for taking the time to be here and thank you for, for sharing your story with us today. Is there anyone else from the public that would like to testify on this bill? Hearing none, uh, we will close uh, testimony. And members, do you have any questions on House File 2008 as amended, starting with Representative Finke, then Representative Keel, and then Representative Backer? Representative thank, Finke, go ahead. Thank you, Chair Fisher. And thank you, Representative Kozlowski, for bringing this bill. Um, I love this bill. I want to see more bills like this. I think that. Uh, there are so many families and there are so many people in this country who we give direct cash payments to all the time, non-controversially. And very often we don't want to give those payments for reasons that are paternalistic or racist or worse to people who need that money the most. So I don't want one of your one of your 
testifiers said that this allows people to be creative mm -hmm. in solving their own problems. And I think that's one of the most important things that we can enable people to do is solve their own problems creatively and as they see fit. Um, my question is, um, Section 1, Subdivision 5 says that uh, the counties and youth prize shall establish a stipend amount. Um, I'm not asking you what that will be, but do we have a sense of what others have offered and, and um, what that might look like? Representative Kozlowski. Chair Fisher and Representative Finke, thank you so much. And um, I couldn't agree with you more to your comments. Um, we've seen cash stipends um, and the reporting that has gone and paired that's being proposed in this bill um, work very successfully as our uh, states in New York and um, Winnipeg, Canada. There's, uh, you know, examples of how this really, um, the outcomes are are very good and put the money back in and the, the power back into the hands of people who have so often and systematically had that power stripped. But I actually want to um, open it up to my testifier to be able to explain a little bit more about, there's both the the monthly cash stipend as well as the um, one larger stipend that would be available too. Yeah, in Hennepin and, County we're a and little- Welcome back to the committee, uh, Ms. Quincy Powell, if you'd like to go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> and my other name is Christy Snyder. Um, but I will I, say- I apologize. <laughs> it's okay. Um, it, I will say that in Hennepin County, it'll be $1,000 a month, um, which roughly is around what shared um, housing outcomes would be in Hennepin County. However, if you're parenting, which is a um, foster youth and parenting youth were a priority population for the young people, people that identified through the workshops. Um, and so parenting youth will get $1,200 a month, and then they'll get a one-time stipend of $4,000 at any point during the two years. Okay, thank you. Representative Finke. Thank you, Chair Fisher. Um, I just want to make sure that's enough money to, to achieve the outcome that the pilot is trying to achieve. Um, I'm sure other people will want to know if that's too much money, but I just is that enough money for these individuals to, to, to take the action that we're looking for them to take? Uh, is that a question that's back a qu to the that's a question? Okay, and who would like to take that? Uh, Russ Kozlowski or uh, Ms. Snyder? We went back and forth around that. Um, and the biggest concern was the end. Um, what happens at the end, and that's something that people often talk about, which is why we put more in the one-time payment. Um, what we have found is that moving from homelessness to being housed is so expensive. Um, and perhaps the $4,000 isn't enough. Um, we're seeing young people, I'm getting text messages from young people even in this room that are moving from um, homelessness to housed and it's anywhere from $3,000 to up and that's not even including getting a bed or furniture or anything like that. So that one time payment could go up. Yeah, thank you. Okay, next I have uh, Representative Keel. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Representative Kozalski. Uh, I wanted to know, first of all, what other states, uh, I heard New York, but whether, what other states have you seen this program uh, provided and uh, what is the background on it? How is it working? Representative Kozalski. Thank you, Chair Fisher and uh, Representative Keel. And as I mentioned, there are other examples. Um, New York is the only other one that I know of that has the focus on youth. And uh, we do have a representative from Chapin Hall who has been working on these evidence-based. Um, and actually, I believe that in New York, they're one year into their study and so they can show a uh, glimmer into the pathway of the successes and maybe some of the, the lessons learned um, at this point. Thanks, Representative Kozowski. Okay. So, Representative, I uh, sorry. that we go through the chair here. So, no, I apologize for that. Um, uh, Ms. Berger Gonzalez, if you'd like to go ahead, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, great question. Uh, we are currently up and running in New York City. Uh, funding um, and pathways for implementing this are up and running. San Francisco will launch in May. Oakland, California will follow shortly thereafter. Um, Boston, Baltimore, and LA County are all in the pipeline as well, setting up an, uh, the, the, basically a runway for uh, pulling all this data together and being able to say across, including Minnesota, across nationally, this is the impact of this, of this pilot program in all of these sites. Uh, New York, the outcomes that we've seen so far 
Again, these are super initial. Uh, cash started be just, was um, starting to be dispersed in May of last year. Um, what we're seeing is that a lot of young people um, are moving from homelessness to permanent housing or to some sort of temporary housing, staying with a family member um, until they figure things out, so moving out of a shelter. Um, we are also seeing that young people are saving the money. It's the first time in their life that they've actually had a, a nest, and so they're, they're holding on to it and saving it. So we're seeing um, an increase in savings. We've also seen a lot of young people leave jobs that where they're more working three jobs with 1099s, and they're working jobs that are night shifts so they can find something more stable and invest in their own education. Um, so the those are some of the initial, and again, we're, we're only not, we're just about a year in, so um, this is the impact thus far. Representative Keel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so this is a really, really new program. We don't really have data for a whole year of what this does, and I have some skepticism about making sure the rent gets from the uh, person who receives it, because I'm looking at this. Um, do we have any way to track where that dollar is going. I noticed it's, it's um, I think it's later, um, but I think when we hand out that first dollar, um, we certainly wanna know where it's going and how it's being used because unfortunately during COVID, I'm gonna share this, it's a little different, but during COVID, I had um, people that owned rental units that did not wanna kick their people out and they were reserved, received COVID dollars but they did not pay any part of their rent. And many times the renters would call, the owners would call and say, you know, I don't even care if they give me a hundred dollars, even though they own me. And I live in a rural area, so rent is around 500, $600 for a basic one bedroom. Um, they were not receiving it. So I think what we made a mistake on was we should have said, you know what, we'll help you with your rent during COVID, but oh, by the way, the, the person who is renting the building needs to sign off on that money so that we know that it's going where it needs to go. Now, granted, um, sometimes it's challenging to make that money go as far as you need it to go, but my concern is, is that we need to keep, uh, we have a responsibility to the citizens of Minnesota. They wanna help youth out. I actually personally believe they'd be better off in a family setting where they could get some more stability. You know, it, it, it's gotta be awfully difficult to be um, left in a country. The young lady that talked about, oh my gosh, you went from Haiti to Minnesota. What a shock that was. <laughs> I'm sure we weren't as warm. Um, but just the other challenges with it, knowing where to go, what to do. And we just passed a bill uh, last, was it Thursday? on homeless youth also to provide them with facilities. But I just, being a parent of adult children now, knowing that that is a really important part of our life to be able to have the direction and the, and the um, support systems as you're trying to figure out what it is that you need to do, whether it's schooling or help with parenting or many other things, healthcare, I just, I, I, as a mother, I just have a real hard time with um, how we're looking at this. I, I, I really think there's some things we need to stop and think about. Um, but one thing I would really urge is that we talk about where that money is, how we're um, accounting for it. And, uh, and we picked a couple of the largest, maybe um, in your bill, the Hennepin County most populous, St. Louis County, not quite so much, and the distance in that county um, that uh, it will be challenging for people to get where they need to go. Um, that's, a, that's a big county um, uh, anyway, and sparse. So um, yeah, I just, I, I'd like to know how we're going to track the recipients. Well, that'll be my last question with okay. the stipends. <clears throat> Representative Kozlowski. Thank you, Chair Fisher and Representative Keel. Um, really important questions and, um, you know, thinking through being really intentional. Of course, this is a pilot project. Um, and so we're going to learn a lot. And also, I think one of the thing about um, being in Minnesota is that, um, you know, opportunity right now with the state, with the 
the dollars that we have to go big so everybody can go home. And we did pass the, the Pathways Home Act, which I'm incredibly proud of. We need housing across all the continuum, um, especially for our youth to be able to get guaranteed cash plus assistance and then um, access and, and find a place to, of their choosing, call home. You know, for me, um, the reason why I wanted to carry this bill, and why I'm so proud of our communities for choosing me to, um, to carry it forward with our community is because I myself was, uh, I didn't realize growing up that I was homeless, couching, I uh, surf couching. And a program like this, where there were bouts of times when I was 16 and 17 as, uh, you know, little leash as a Mexican Ojibwe kid, um, non-binary, two-spirit person, I didn't know I was a statistic. And, um, you know, to the point of like having people with their families and community, I think that's the thing about our youth and the beauty of this is that we have the state, we have the county, we have our community-based programs who know our youth, who are in our communities, and we have our youth driving this. Um, and being able to trust them that uh, we're going to have dollars that aren't going to compete with their food, with their other benefits that they're receiving. Um, I'd just say that, um, you know, our youth, especially the youth of color, our LGBTQ youth and other, you know, our people not who are down and out, but who have done more with less. And one thing we talk a lot about is that people figure out a way to survive, right? You find a couch, you find some food, um, and you find your people. And that's the piece that I'm looking forward to, that we have those, um, you know, entities who, who live, live and breathe best practices and evidence base. And that also, you know, as people moving through this, um, stats and, and numbers and statistics and accountability will surely be baked into this but so too does, does the heart and trust, and that starts with stressing our, our youth. Um, I would guess invite, again, my testifier to share a little bit more about, you know, working with the youth, and there will be housing navigators, and people um, paired with our youth every step of the way, and I think that's also the important piece to, to keep in mind that um, there will be guides and supports caked into this process. So, Chair, if you would, um, Allow yeah. my testifier to uh, share. But very briefly, we're running way mm -hmm. over time right now. So uh, we've got, I'll take a brief comment and then we've got Representative Backer and then we've got Representative Edelson if they could keep their questions so we could get on to the other bills. Uh, go ahead, uh, Ms. Burr Gonzalez. Thank you so much. I'll be very brief, Representative Keel. On the tracking piece, um, there are dozens of guaranteed income cash transfer programs around the country that they have been tracking um, how individuals have been spending the money. And it's only resulting in spending on basic needs. With this has been evident time and time again um, about how, you know, how individuals are spending the cash. We have chosen in this pilot because it's been co-designed with young people with lived expertise to say that we are, we're centering it in trust. So we are not tracking. What we are doing though is capturing outcomes on a monthly basis. And those outcomes are on housing, well-being, food insecurity. That's what's telling us about how young people are spending the cash. So we're very outcomes focused and this is something that we hope to bring to the committee and the legislature. Um, and then I'll just second Representative Kozowski's focus on this is a cash plus model, meaning it's cash with optional supportive services. Those support, supportive services are driven to support those outcomes that I just mentioned. And that's because young people said we have both financial and non-financial barriers to getting housed. So that's what this program is really designed to do is address those two pieces. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to Representative Packer now. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, first question. Um, I understand, unless I'm not reading this correctly, re reporting of the success of this program doesn't start right away. It's like in St. Louis and Hennepin, it's like a year, two years, three years down the road. Um, I think it would be prudent, what I, and if I'm wrong, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it would be imprudent, prudent to get st reporting right away. Did I, did I misunderstand that when I was reading, looking at the bill? Representative Kozlowski. Thank you, Chair and Representative Backer. You know, uh, sorry, I didn't have the language right in front of me. I'm assuming we're talking about uh, Section 3, 3.1 in the report. And as I read it um, and understand that, yes, the report would be due to the legislature 
um, following. And I'm open. I've, I've been working on a number of different bills where we've included a report um, and have more uh, consistent reporting. And so if that's something that you would like to work on, I, you know, we welcome the conversation, especially as we begin a pilot. Back. Yeah, thank um, Chair, and thank you. I think that's prudent. I mean, uh, obviously, we have heard this is somewhat uh, new on the block, okay? This is not like we have years and years of history. So you can't change course of what's working and focus on what's working um, instead of not what's working. Um, as an EMS individual volunteer, we do know that... Um, Substance abuse is a hard thing to overcome. Now, I'm not saying everybody that's going to get cash in this program has a, a substance abuse, but there will be a percentage of those people that will do that. They, they will, it's human nature to go to down that path. We have all have, have skeletons in our background, okay? So I would encourage to look at ways to do a report sooner to see what's working, what's not working, because obviously you're passionate about this to work. So that's my first thing, and I would, would be happy to work with you on that. Second thing, why did we pick 18 to 24? We do unfortunately have youth on our streets that are younger than 18. We have um, 16, we have 17, and probably, as we know, younger, not probably. We know that as a fact. Why 18 to 24? Why did that that age group in this bill? That's my second and last question. Okay. Uh, Representative Kozlowski. Yes, thank you so much. And um, to the question, I think one of the important things to the report also is that part of this program will look, uh, you know, in uh, – creating the cohort of folks who will participate. A portion will receive cash and a portion will not. And so that will also be reflected in. So um, look forward to continue conversations on reporting out on what is going to um, work best for illuminating the roadmap forward. And then in terms of we've had a number of conversations for 18 to 24 um, and the carryover, and I will actually turn it over to my testifier to share more about why that specific age range. Uh, just very quick, we are way over time, so y'all, 30 seconds, please. Yeah. Go ahead, Ms. Snyder. So, I mean, because we don't have emancipated minor laws and that sort of thing, they can't have bank accounts without a parent um, or a guardian. And so we would want the 18 to 24-year-olds, because they're adults, they can open up bank accounts. They have the legal right to be able to um, be the authority and the, the legal person of record. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Edelson, uh, quick question. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Koslowski. I, I, you know, I was going to ask a question, but I, I realize we are short on time. I just wanted to, um, to tell you thank you for this bill, if we, if we could follow up just on a few things. But um, as somebody, you know, I represent Edina, but, and, and I think there's a lot of, of what people get from that. But when I was 16, I was homeless. And when I was 16, my mom was incarcerated. And those are things that are hard for me to say as well. And um, just, you know, when I, Representative Keel, you had talked about, you know, that people should be with their families. Now, a lot of us don't have families. And I know you know that, Representative Keel. And, and you know, Representative Backer, you had said years and years of history of, of, of something, of, of making sure that we have reports. We have years and years of history of knowing that young people, especially if you don't have a family, and especially if, if you lack access to wealth, um, that you're left behind. You're treated less than. And so very happy to support this. And thank you for all your work. Thank you, Representative Edelson. With that, I renew my motion that House File 2008, as amended, is referred to the Children and Families Finance and Policy Committee. All those in favor of referring House File 2008, as amended, to the Children and Finance P Committee, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, say nay. No. No. The motion prevails in House File 2008, as amended, is referred to the Children and Families Committee, uh, Ch Children and Families Finance and Policy <coughs> Committee.